in my position in practice, I field a lot of questions, both from clinicians as well as from um, affected people and their families. And it's a very frequent question um, and, and apparently a point of confusion, like what is schizoaffective disorder? And since this is an audience of clinicians, um, I just want to help you, I mean, to remind you of this. Uh, amongst clinicians, we can, I, I think we think about diagnosis sometimes very fluidly and we can change them or add them, revise them um, fairly quickly and, um, and oftentimes for good reasons. But do keep in mind that for your patients, they don't have the history of understanding psychiatric diagnosis like you or I do. And adding, taking away, revising can be a big deal and lead to a lot of confusion. So, um, and I think I, me I mentioned this because from affected people I get, I mean, one of the most common questions is please explain schizoaffective dis disorder. I hear, I've got this now, I didn't have it, and there's, you know, some confusion. So I figured I would talk about schizoaffective disorder. Um, and among other reasons to talk about this today um, is that <laughs> it's a common question because as you'll learn the, the reliability of the diagnosis itself and the, I mean, the criteria for diagnosing it are open to some interpretation and some problems. Um, and it, it really sort of points some intellectual fingers at um, areas of psychiatric illness categorization that definitely need more attention. Uh, so I'm not going to solve all of the problems of psychiatric nosology in today's short lecture, but I do want to go over how we got to this diagnostic concept. I uh, want to spend some time showing you verbatim DSM-5 criteria for schizoaffective disorder and, um, and show you where the problems come in. And then I'll take a brief tour into biology to see how well um, biological factors or real world observations line up with the theoretical diagnostic construct. Um, and I think we'll leave it at that. Sarah Dugan is going to talk next week about pharmacotherapy. So um, this is a two part lecture series. So let's get into talking about this by way of history. Um, ML Kreppelin, German psychiatrist um, working in the late 19th century, early 20th century, really, really big figure in psychiatric thought. And one of the, you know, the, the towering concepts of psychiatric diagnostic classification comes back to what he said in 1898, 1899, uh, that amongst people with psychosis symptoms, there are two categories. There is one that he called dementia precox, which later morphed into the term schizophrenia. Um, that is, in his view, very focused on psychosis and very absent with affective disturbance. Uh, there's another category of patients with psychotic illness that have manias or depressions or alternate between them. Um, he called this the manic depressive psychosis. Today, we call it bipolar disorder. Um, he set up those two categories and uh, also in Kreplin's view, dementia precox or the non-affective psychosis was seen as something that occurs early in life and persists or gets worse over time. Um, that view is being revised from 21st century observations in neuroscience. Um, and manic depressive illness was in, in contrast to being consistent durable and lifelong uh, manic depressive illness was seen as episodic and with uh, opportunities for uh, full recovery in between episodes. So these two concepts, I mean, they still are embedded in DSM today um, and it's called the Kreplinian dichotomy. Um, it's a nice idea, but it, I mean, I think anybody, anybody who's a clinician listening to this will understand that it doesn't really line up with how things are in the real world. Um, and a guy named Kassanen in 1933 felt so moved by the reality of that there are these patients in between 
non-affective psychosis and affective psychosis that um, that he he wrote a paper. He wasn't the first one to call attention to the need for a in-between category, uh, but he did coin a term schizoaffective. So he wanted to bring in the concept of schizophrenia and the concept of affective disorder. Um, and that is where, I mean, that's, that's the person who made the term schizoaffective. Um, and, you know, because it was 1933 and you could do things like this, he just wrote a paper that described nine cases and, um, and, and with that made the argument that there is this group of people that clearly have psychosis and clearly have affective disturbance. And more or less he called for a need to be more inclusive in our thinking around um, the, the, the nature of psychotic illnesses. Uh, which is a good point. And uh, again, any clinician understands this, um, but it's been, it's been extraordinarily difficult to try to define, to try to operationalize what actually is the meaning of in-between. Um, and uh, Winnicor um, did an analysis of the literature and came up with 24 different definitions um, for schizoaffective disorder since the Kassanen paper um, up until that point. And I, I love this phrase, it's called uh, by Marneros and colleagues, um, a nosological nuisance, but a clinical reality. So um, again, we know for sure that there are people who don't neatly line up with non-affective psychosis and affective psychosis. There's a blend um, quite often, but where do you draw the line to make a category? And should you draw a line to make a category is another question. It's been, it's been a thorn in the side. Um, here is how, here's current thought, 21st century thought about how to diagnose, about how to define or operationalize schizoaffective disorder. This is from DSM-5. I took out a few extra words that don't really add to it, but there has to be first an uninterrupted period of illness in which we see both a major mood episode, either depressive or manic, um, along with concurrent with criterion A for schizophrenia. I'll show you a slide for that in a second. In addition to that, that you have a co-occurrence of mood disturbance and criteria A psychosis, um, you have to establish that delusions or hallucinations have gone on for more than two weeks after the mood episode has fully resolved. Um, you also have to establish that during the lifetime of the illness or the disturbance that uh, mood symptoms or mood, mood episode symptoms are present for, interesting phrase, the majority of the total duration, um, and that it's not due to drug effects or other medical conditions. So um, just to go over criterion A, um, this is criteria A for schizophrenia. Um, one month period during which you have two of the following and one of the two has to be delusions, hallucinations, or disorganization. Um, you can also have grossly disorganized or catatonic behavior or negative symptoms, which bear a very striking similarity to depression. Um, so you could imagine a person who has delusions of guilt um, or delusions of punishment, um, as well as diminished emotional expression or abolition or lack of spontaneity. Um, in other words, you could, walk, you could have somebody who has psychotic depression um, and, 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 and meet that criterion um, incorrectly, but that's, that's one of the weaknesses. Speaking of other weaknesses in the current definition, we talked about one, um, major mood episode has to be concurrent, but if criterion A actually has symptoms that look like depression, that's a point of significant confusion. Um, Delusions and hallucinations need to be present for two weeks or more after the mood episode has concluded definitively. Good luck in finding that out. Um, oftentimes people don't recall exactly when their psychosis began or ended or when their mood episode began or ended. And it will take a lot of work um, um, to try to get that with clarity. Um, and this is a, you know, what is exactly the definition of majority? I mean, per the, di per the dictionary, it should be more than 50% of the time. Um, so theoretically, that means that somebody who's had four years of illness, 
but has only had a mood episode for 1.9 of those years, they don't merit a diagnosis of schizoaffective disorder. So the intent is it has to be a big piece of it. Um, but of course, then what do we do if we give somebody a antidepressant or an antimanic drug and they no longer have an affective disturbance? Does that count as, um, I mean, do they, do they then become undiagnosed with schizoaffective disorder because we have now treated their affective disturbance? Uh, unresolved question, but it leads to, I think, a lot of the dilemmas around, um, well, diagnostic reliability. So there's a, there's a statistic called CAPA, which is trying to get at the percentage of agreement between two conditions that isn't just due to randomness. <clears throat> and the, it, it's a standard measure of um, reliability. Basically, a higher kappa value means higher reliability between either two raters or between two different points in time. Um, here, we're looking at some data that show point to point, like one point in time versus another point in time reliability. Kappa statistic on the right three bars are for schizophrenia, bipolar disorder and, and unipolar major depression. Um, and you'll see that here, the kappa statistic for schizoaffective disorder is pretty much lower than the rest of them. Also, the standard error bars around it are much higher, uh, which again, suggests the dilemmas that clinicians have in um, recognizing it reliably. Um, and a really bad case analysis, uh, Schwartz and colleagues looked at um, two-year follow-up of people that had, had, that had received a diagnosis of schizoaffective disorder um, versus schizophrenia versus bipolar disorder. And over two-year period of time, uh, there's a pretty high retention of the original diagnosis, 83% and 92% for bipolar or schizophrenia respectively. Uh, but the two-year stability of schizoaffective disorder was less than 40%, um, indicating that there are some issues with this diagnosis. Similarly, you'll find that between two different clinicians or three different clinicians, um, inter-rater reliability is similarly subpar. Um, <clears throat> let's look then, another thing that leads to um, whether a diagnosis is valid or not is you know, to the extent to which it lines up with some biological or clinical course reality. And lots of studies have looked at things like neuro, you know, ana anatomical structure, neurophysiological function under imaging, um, neuropsychological findings, clinical course over time, genetic markers. And the literature is full of studies that say very clearly, it looks very much like bipolar disorder. No, 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 looks very much like schizophrenia. No, 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 looks very much like its own thing. I mean, there's really not any agreement. And, um, speaking to the problematic nature of this um, diagnosis. So one thing, I mean, if those of you, anybody who's listened to me for a long enough will hear me say, I love drugs because drugs tell the truth. Drugs are, um, I call them touchstones to physiological reality. Um, and there are studies that look at, are there certain medications which are more likely to be effective for somebody with this schizoaffective disorder diagnosis um, Dr. Dugan will talk more about pharmacotherapy next week, but suffice it to say that, yeah, there seems to be um, a, a person with this diagnosis is more likely to have a therapeutic response to lithium or carbamazepine or a, you know, bipolar focused medicine than they would from a traditional um, first line antipsychotic drug. So medications would suggest maybe it's more like a bipolar disorder, um, but hopefully we'll have more discussion on that in coming times. Um, there we go, summary. Uh, to summarize then, this idea that you have non-affective psychosis and affective psychosis, and these are two separate camps, is, is, I mean, it was flawed from the beginning. And I personally don't think it should have been enshrined in psychiatric notology for as long as it has been. Um, and schizoaffective disorder acknowledges the clinical reality that these two, these two groups are not entirely separate. Um, it remains difficult, and, and I think the difficulties we have in defining it exactly speaks to broader definition, broader difficulties that exist in how we conceptualize mental illness in general, 
Um, and the more we study it, the more we understand that probably we need to get a new system entirely, hopefully one that's based on physiology, not just clinical symptoms. Uh, Parker, um, you can get a reference. It's open access paper uh, in the next slide. Uh, Parker had a great summary of schizoaffective disorder and final analysis. When you see that diagnosis, then you should, you should understand that there's likely to be some uncertainty. And um, over time, a person may more clearly uh, you know, be recognized as having a bipolar disorder or a schizophrenia. So hold that in some skepticism. Um, I do think that at least for the benefit of patients who um, might not have such an ability to be flexible with how we categorize illness, because I mean, it does take, it's been a complicated road to get here, so it takes some time to wrap your head around. Um, I, I, I think for patient and families, we should be really careful about assigning the diagnosis. And I would recommend that we just go to DSM criteria and when it's really clear that they've met it, then yes, assign it. But if not, um, there's always not otherwise specified or some other, you know, other thing to, 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 to assign. Um, and also per Parker, if you see this diagnosis and a person has never been on lithium or a classical um, bipolar medicine, um, it argues that this might be an opportunity for that.